at this point, I think uh, everybody's catching on, getting good to go. We'll start. Um, I'm going to try to go through all of our 15, 16 species of bat we have in Kentucky, provide you all plenty of time for questions. If you have questions, send them through and I'll try to answer them either during the presentation or at the end. But let's get started here. Uh, I said I've been doing this for 20 years almost. Uh, we need to start by talking about why do we even care about bats? What's, what are they good for anyways? I mean, most people think of bats as uh, these creatures that fly along, maybe get stuck in your hair while you're out in the swimming pool at night, but they actually do have uh, some pretty interesting facts and some benefits along with them. So the first thing we're looking at here, interesting bat fact number one, I'm sure most everyone here knows, for those of you that don't, bats echolocate. So that means that as they're flying around at night, they are making this pulse of sound that goes out kind of like the sonar, bounces off of objects and comes back and they can use that to differentiate between objects that they want to eat or drink and objects they want to avoid while they're flying around at night. Here's just a real quick demonstration to kind of give you all an illustration of what I'm talking about. So this bat is pulsing out this sound that's representing these yellow lines. It's bouncing off of this bug that it's trying to eat. And when it bounces off of the bug, it then hears it and goes over to try to capture it. But let's look at a little bit better video. So this is actually uh, something I pulled off of the internet of a bat flying through the air. You see it's coming at that moth, scooping it up in its tail membrane and then bringing it up to its mouth. All of that is done in complete pitch dark it can do this basically just by sound. Another thing to look at, this is a photo that uh, Price Sewell, another bat biologist in Kentucky took. That's a raffinesque big-eared bat that's actually going down into a mud puddle and getting a drink. So as you can see, this bat can maneuver through the woods at dark and be able to go at probably, that bat's probably six, seven miles an hour as it's flying through the air and can dip down just to the water's level to stick its tongue out and get it a little bit of a drink. Now, that's pretty impressive in my mind. Let's look at our se second interesting bat fact. Um, how much does everybody think a bat weighs? Uh, you know, you can see from some of the ones you see flying around, you know, they're about head to tail. Some of them are about that big. Some of them go all the way down to about that big. Interestingly enough, uh, let's look at this next picture here. This is a photo of an eastern small-footed bat. It's got a pup hanging off of it. You can see that's my hand holding it. Um, you can see in relation to my finger there that that thing isn't even as big as my thumb. That bat, as an adult, weighs about four to five grams. So just to put that into perspective, a nickel that you pull out of your pocket right now, if you weighed that nickel, it would weigh five grams. So that bat weighs maybe about as much as one nickel. So that's something else to think about as we move into some of the other biological characteristics here. Next bat fact we have here, how long does everybody think a bat can live? Uh, you know, most people think of bats as, oh, they're just flying mice. Mice are known to have this lifespan of a few months at best. Well, what about a bat? Well, we actually put uh, these little bands on a bat's wing, and we'll talk about the banding process later, but uh, in much the same way as people that waterfowl hunt know about banding ducks and geese, we use that for information on not only where these bats travel, but also how long they live. And we've found by some of this banding data that some of our bats can live over 10 years, several of them live for over 10 years, and some of them can live upwards of 20, 21 years. That's a really long lifespan for something, again, that's so small. Here's another interesting bat fact. Um, some of our bats migrate. How far do you think this little animal can migrate in one season? So just to give you kind of the, uh, the lifespan of a bat, right now we're in April. These bats are emerging out of the caves for some of them that live in caves, and they will actually migrate for long distances over to where they're going to spend their summer. And then in the fall, they'll leave those summer grounds and For a quick example, this map shows a uh, study that was done back in the 60s with Indiana bats. It's one of our federally protected species of bat. They emerge from this winter location in Kentucky, from a cave there, tracked 100 miles up to the summer site. Bats that, again, 
maybe three or four inches from head to tail. So the bats weigh about six pounds. And they can emerge from a, essentially a cave, hole in the ground in the middle of the woods, fly 300 miles to a tree in Michigan, in the summer in Michigan, and then fly from there back to Kentucky, find that same hole in the ground that the winter in, and in the next spring, fly back to the same exact tree. Small that can fly miles. We have some species of bat that can fly over 600 miles on its migration, utilizing the same areas year in year out. Going out into the woods, uh, it can be pretty easy to get disoriented sometimes. Uh, some have fly around the same tree up in the summer in Michigan and the same cave in Kentucky. Again, that's another interesting fact. So looking through here real quick, uh, what do you hear about bats? Well, first off, bats are interesting, right? I mean, I've just given you four really good examples. this and we have the cucumber beetle over in the middle both of those do a tremendous job of eating to eat so the corn ear there it is eating on the farmer's corn crop and then it emerges that it becomes one of the major prey one of our more common bats we have in the state imagine Cucumbers, watermelons, squash, zucchini, all of those. This is also for some of our big brown Keep it in this hand? All right. Sorry about that. Sounds like we've got a little bit of disruption here. So now that we know a little bit about what bats do for us, let's look at the uh, major species groups that we have in Kentucky. I'm trying to condense this down so we can get through this uh, relatively quickly. I won't go into each species, but we've got roughly 15 species in the state, as you see, maybe 16 soon. Uh, the Brazilian or Mexican free tail bat is a bat that uh, most people see down in Texas and throughout the South, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. They're actually starting to be found up into Tennessee. There's a colony now in Knoxville, and I would imagine in the next 10 to 20 years, we may start getting that species up into Kentucky. Just to break down these groups, we have three major groups here. Uh, I'm gonna call one our forest bats. So that are bats that are living in the forest all of their life. They're either migrating to warmer areas in the winter, or they're actually hibernating on the forest floor. Um, then we have cave bats next. Cave bats, as you'd imagine, are bats that are going to live in caves all year long. They come out every night to forage, or during the winter they hibernate in a cave, but you'll never see them roosting in and around the trees. And then we have this third group that will actually utilize caves to hibernate. They'll migrate out and use the trees in the forest, or sometimes your house, to roost in in the summertime. And then in the fall, they'll migrate back to caves, and that's where they'll spend their winters at. So let's look at these forest bats or tree bats. Uh, as you see here, we've got about five species that I've considered uh, to be forest bats. Uh, most of these being the silver-haired bat, red bat, hoary bat, and seminole bat, they're gonna be migrators that are moving in and out of the state, depending on what weather it is. But then, show you some pictures here. What you see, the interesting thing about this group of bats is if you look at the red bat up at the top right corner, you'll see it's got that fur, really heavy fur, going all the way down its tail. So red bats are probably one of our more common bats we have here in the state. And they have a hibernation strategy in the wintertime. Um, when it gets cold, this bat will actually fly down, land on the forest floor, and will curl that furred tail membrane that you see there up over top of its head and use it as a blanket. And it'll actually sleep 
down in the leaf litter on the ground. If you go out on a relatively warm night in February and you just happen to see a bat flying around light or by the light, you one of those red bats there. Uh, moving real quick through the remainder, you have the top middle, that's a free bat that we have in the state. It migrates through. Uh, we don't catch them very often some of our capture techniques. We're having trouble with the... Yeah, I, for some reason, it's weak when I just turn it away from me, so just keep it visible to me here. Okay. Sorry. All right, sorry about that. Uh, hoary bats up there in the middle, and then this picture up at the top left was uh, sent to us by one of our WMA managers that are silver-haired bats that uh, were roosting in a, I think it was an old black locust that had fallen over. When it fell over and they went to look at it, there was two or three silver-haired bats roosting in an overwintering. You won't find that species in Kentucky in the summertime. It's usually migrating up north during that time, or it'll actually hang around up north. But in the spring and in the fall, people will find these a lot. This is one I'll get a lot of phone calls about, uh, silver-haired bats in the spring and in the fall because it'll roost on the sides of people's houses as it's moving around. Finally, we have down at the bottom the uh, Seminole bat. It's uh, very, very similar to the red bat. We're typically only finding those in far western Kentucky, although it's starting to move east a little bit up into nearly Louisville at this point. And we have the evening bat down in the uh, bottom center there. Evening bats, again, were another species that used to only be found in far western Kentucky, but as climates have begun to change, they're actually moving into the remainder of our state. Take a break here to look at, we've got a couple, I think it's Ian, says, what's the largest bat in Kentucky? The largest bat in Kentucky is the hoary bat up there, top center, the one that's got those kind of white frosted tips of hair on it. Uh, you can't really tell very well from that photo, but that species is gonna be, uh, what's the best way to think about it? It's about the size of a large egg, probably. the best way I can think. So head to tail, it's about that big around, and if you're holding it in your hand, which I don't recommend anyone do, you're gonna hold it. You know, so it's probably about that big around. It's uh, it's somewhere around 25 grams to 30 grams. It's tremendously big, but greater than some of the uh, the other species we have in the state. Let's move through here. So now we have our three species of cave bats. So cave bats are again a species that's going to live in a cave, basically roosting in a cave throughout the entirety of its life, both in the winter and in the we have two species, two of our four species that are on the federal endangered species list are cave bats, meaning the Virginia big-eared bat there in the middle and the gray bat down at the bottom. Look at some quick photos here of these three species. Top left, this is a Virginia big-eared bat. It's pretty obvious where it gets its name from. Uh, ears on a Virginia, or on, sorry, that's a Raffinesse big-eared bat. And its ears are gonna be about that long. Gray bats down here at the bottom. And then we have a cluster of Virginia big-eared bats up at the top right there. So as you can see, uh, the big-eared bats get their name for a really good reason. These ears, and when they're, they'll actually kind of curl them around like the, like a ram's horn. Then you have gray bats down here at the bottom. Um, I didn't put the picture in here. Someone sent me a photo. I said that these bats typically uh, that's true, they also will occasionally roost in bridges, and we do have a couple bridges in Kentucky that have gray bats, but one of the more interesting photos I've gotten of gray bats is that they were overnight roosting. I think it was because they had a storm come through and they were just trying to find a place to get out of the rain. Uh, there was uh, two or three that actually took up residence on a person's pontoon boat for a while, so we had a pretty neat picture pop in there. Moving through here real quickly. Now we have those bats that again are overwintering in a cave before moving into the trees in the forest to spend their summertime roosting and then moving back into caves again in the wintertime. This is the bulk of our species. What is that? Two, four, six, seven of these species um, have this kind of life history adaptation. Indiana bats and northern bats, Myotis septentrionalis and Myotis sodalis, those are the two species of bat that are also on the federally endangered species list. So let's move through and look at some photos of those real quick while that's popping up. Uh, 
Rachel asks, do certain bats like to hang out in certain types of trees? Yes. So Indiana bats that we were just talking about are on the federal endangered species list, and that's a picture of an Indiana bat right there with a pup actually attached to it still. She was moving away from her roost tree. Indiana bats really like to roost in trees like shagbark hickories, for example, a tree that's got that bark that kind of sloughs off, that gives them that space that they're not getting up into a hollow tree. They're getting between the tree and the bark, and that's where they're roosting. Uh, another tree that it likes to use is uh, ash trees. Right now, you're getting a lot of dead ash trees. With those ash trees, when they're alive, you don't get that crawl under, but as they die, that bark slowly starts to peel up. 100, 200 bats living underneath of one little sheet of bark there. Let's see, we've got another good question. Uh, Eli, age six, says, how long do bats sleep per day? It's a good question, Eli. It depends on the, type, the time of year. Um, in the wintertime, when they are hibernating, they're asleep, if you want to call it that, for a few months. In the summertime, when they're up and foraging, they're going to be sleeping for, I would say, roughly 10 to 12 hours Day before they get up they usually right about dusk is when they'll emerge from their roost and go out and forage all night they may come back for a nap and to rest their wings for a little bit during the middle of the night and then they'll be back out foraging all the way until sunrise so for some species uh, they're in the summertime 10 to 12 hours something like that in the wintertime several weeks at a time let's look through these species we have here uh, the big brown bat is up here at the top left corner that is the bat, if you've had a bat in your house, nine chances out of 10, it's a big brown bat. Uh, they're known for having these really large teeth, as you can see in this picture. The reason they have those large teeth is because one of the main things that they like to eat is a beetle. So as you know, if you pick up a beetle, it's got that really hard exoskeleton on it. Those bats need that really heavy set of teeth to bust through that exoskeleton and chew them up. Again, not only that, but these are a major predator on a lot of our pests that are going out and foraging on these uh, pest species that are impacting our crops. Moving over, the next photo there, that is a uh, small-footed bat that's taken out of a, that's actually roosting in a bridge crevice. That's the smallest species we bat, of bat in we have in Kentucky. We've talked about that, about four grams, maybe five grams. Down at the bottom, we have little brown bats. That's a bat that used to be very common in the state before white-nose syndrome hit. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard what white-nose syndrome is, it's a fungus that was first discovered in New York in, I believe, 2006. Quick, quickly moved throughout all of the eastern and central U.S. and is actually being found in the western U.S. now. It's a fungal infection that is drastically impacting our bat species. Uh, little brown bats, for example, we've probably lost 90% of our little bat, brown bat population in Kentucky because of white nose syndrome. Uh, that used to be one of the more common species we'd find in Kentucky. Now it's actually being considered for protection under the Endangered Species Act. Moving on, the Indiana bat is down in the middle. We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, that is one of the species that is protected under the Endangered Species Act in Kentucky. Um, it likes to live in these uh, dead or dying trees or trees like shagbark hickories that have a lot of that exfoliating bark, bark that's peeling up that they can crawl under. And then we have the eastern pipistrelle or tricolor bat is the bat over on the bottom right corner. Uh, that's a bat, that I, that's a photo I took of a bat while it was hibernating. It likes to hibernate in these really wet, humid parts of the cave. And it's actually in areas, a lot of times it's cold enough to where that uh, water will condense on its skin and, will, and on its fur and will freeze. So when you see these bats in a cave, they'll actually sparkle a lot of times like someone's uh, dipped them in uh, some sort of diamonds or something like that to kind of get that shimmery effect like that. Typically, if you find them in the summertime, they're going to be more of a yellowish brown color. Let's take a few more questions here. Oh, Jaden, age 10, has a really good question. I get this question probably once a week. Is there anything we can do to encourage bats to roost in our bat house? The best thing you can do with a bat house is make sure, number one, to put up the right type of bat house. Um, what I always recommend people do is if you get on Google and type in rocket box bat house, You'll get the design that I think is probably one of the better ones that would uh, get utilized. 
make sure that it's only got an opening about half an inch, three quarters inch on the bottom where they like to roost at. Put that rocket box after you build it up in an area that's gonna get plenty of sun, so not a lot of shade on it, and make sure that it's at least 12 feet, 14 feet up in the air, and that there's not a lot of vegetation underneath of it. You want, bats are gonna emerge from the bottom of these bat houses and free fall before they fly out. You wanna have plenty of room for them to make that drop before they fly away. Other than that, it's a waiting game. I've seen them uh, colonize these bat houses within a couple weeks. Sometimes they'll sit there for years and not utilize them. If you have a bat box that you put up for a year or two and you're not getting any use, feel free to take it down and move it. Well, uh, let's see. Why do they hang upside down? That's a really good question. Um, the why part of it, I don't know that I can answer why as much as I can answer how. So the way that a bat's foot and its tendons are formed is that people think, well, how in the world would you sleep holding on? You know, I couldn't grab onto a set of monkey bars and hold on and fall asleep. Well, that's because the way a human's tendons are made in their hand, you have to exert energy to make that fist to hold on. The way that a tendon works in a bat's foot is that the weight of that bat pulling actually pulls its feet closed automatically. So it can hang on upside down, and as soon as its feet hit and it basically relaxes, those feet will actually dig into the rock, and that's how it holds itself upside down. Nikki says, how can we help with bat research and funding? That's probably my favorite question. The best way to help with research and funding is support Kentucky Wild. Uh, I know that there's been everyone talking about Kentucky Wild on this, uh, these Facebook Live videos so far. Kentucky Wild is essentially your way of contributing to bat research and small mammals, crayfish, salamanders. Uh, this is money that we use that 100% of that goes directly back into funding some of the research projects that we do here in the state. So a lot of the pictures of the bats that you've seen so far today, those bats were captured using equipment that we purchased with Kentucky Wild money. A lot of our projects that we do, all of them come off of Kentucky Wild funding. Let's see. Rachel, age nine, says, what type of bats get white nose syndrome? Uh, out of our 15 species of bat, those bats that live in the forest all the time that don't hibernate in caves, we haven't seen any issues with those getting white nose. Uh, these species that we have up there, those species that transition from caves to the forest and back to caves again, these are the species that are getting impacted the most by white nose, specifically little brown bats, Indiana bats, tricolor or eastern pipistrels, and then the northern long ear bat right there. Those are the four big species that have really been impacted in Kentucky by white nose syndrome, uh, especially for little brown bats, pipistrels, and northerns. We're looking at probably a 90% loss of all of our individuals over the last 10 years or so. Let's move through here. It looks like we've only got a few minutes left. So let's look straight down here to the fun part. This is the one I get asked a lot. Well, how in the world do you study bats? That's the part, that's why I do this. This is the fun part. So we've got mist netting, harp trapping. We can go in the caves and count the bats and acoustic monitoring. Let's look at each one of those real quick. So mist netting, and that's what you see right here. This is actually a mist netting set that was purchased by Kentucky Wild. It's this pole and you can barely see this black net. Right now it's all wound up so that you can kind of see it. What happens is we stretch these big nets. Sometimes they are 60 feet long and 30 feet high up in an area where we think a bat is going to be flying. Uh, in this case, we've got this is along a little backwater channel of Elkhorn Creek. Uh, bats love to forage over top of streams. They love to get water out of streams. And I, we've got this positioned right in this corner so that as the bats turn the corner, they hopefully can't see this net with their echo location and they'll be captured. We do this all summer long. Once we catch a bat, you see here we have a collection of bat biologists. We've got a table set up down at the bottom right corner where we're measuring the forearm. A lot of time that's a diagnostic tool that we can use to determine what species it is. And then up here at the top, we're taking some more measurements and that's where we actually put those bands on that I was talking about before where we can, if we catch this bat four years later, we'll know where we initially caught it at and uh, where it was now. We kind of get some migration data that way. The other thing we do 
radio telemetry. So you can see here this little wire coming off the back of this bat, that's a radio transmitter. Think of that like a uh, little radio station that's emitting this beep every second or so. And then over here on the right hand side, you have a bat biologist with this antenna that can actually pick up that beep and translate into something audible. We can walk around in the woods or sometimes take cars or airplanes and track these bats so that we know, okay, we caught it at this creek, but it may actually be roosting in a tree two miles away. So we can get a little bit better idea of where these bats are moving, where their home range is. Next up, we have harp traps. This is just like using this net, only we're doing this at a cave entrance, as you can see right here. The harp trap is this wire frame that's got a bunch of fishing lines moving up and down, and the idea is that the bats, as they fly out of this cave from behind, <coughs> you see the bats will bounce off of that fishing line and land in a bag. Move through real quick here. This is another fun part of the job. This is doing in-cave surveys. So we actually spend two or three months each year crawling around in caves in Kentucky, looking at those hibernating cave bats and actually we'll count how many bats we see in each cave. We've done this for the last 30 some years and we can develop trends on are the populations increasing or decreasing. What you see, this is me and one of my coworkers, Tracy, we're in a cave and all of this black are bats. Those are actually Indiana bats. If you look at the picture on the top right, that is that same cluster of Indiana bats. If I, I was actually laying down on my back to take that photo, uh, if you kind of pushed all that area together, that's about the area the size of a car hood. The interesting thing is, so that area the size of the car hood, there was about 7,000 bats. So these things will get into densities, Indiana bats will, of uh, sometimes 300 bats per square foot. So think about square foot is about that big, a little bit bigger than a sheet of paper. 300 bats roosting in that area. That's an up close picture. Each one of those little pink dots that you see in this photo, I hope you all can see it, that's a bat's nose. So that's how tightly they're packed in. Wanted to, while I had a real quick minute, have everybody take a look at that picture. That's a picture of a cluster of Indiana bats we took this year that's uh, about that big, we'll say. I want everybody to take a look at that and take a guess on how many bats you think are in that area. I'll give you just a second to look at it. Are any of the uh, guesses coming in yet? Not yet? All right. Let's make it a little bit easier. So the way that we actually do these counts, instead of being in the cave long enough to count each one of these noses, we'll take a digital photograph of it, go back to the office, and we'll put a dot on each one of the noses. And we have software that will actually count those dots and keep track of it. So now that we have all those dots on, you can see how many bats we have in that cluster. That's, that was probably uh, about a two and a half, three square foot cluster of bats. There were 861 bats in that picture. Finally, and this is the, the last bit of technology that we use, this is acoustic detection. So you see this box down here at the bottom. This box will actually listen for bats as they fly by. It will record the sound that they're making as they echolocate. And then as you see from some of these other sonograms up here at the top, that is a visual representation of what that bat's call looks like. And based on the shape of that call, the frequency of the call, you can start getting an idea of what species of bat is in the area just by listening to it the same way that people do with birds. So that is the end of all the pictures. I got a little bit of time left. Let's see what other questions we have. Can you put more than one bat house in the same location? Ed asked that, yes, and we recommend you do so. Um, typically, I like to put bat houses out in clusters of maybe three to five in an area. That tends to have a little bit better success if you give them a couple different places, and they'll actually move between bad houses throughout the season. Another question, is there any opportunities for the public to go out into the field and see the, this data collected up close? Yes. So with Kentucky Wild, this one of the things I didn't mention before is if you put in and become a Kentucky Wild member, we have opportunities throughout the year to where last year I took uh, groups several times out to where we actually went to uh, some of our WMAs, put up nets, and you all got to uh, see how we do actual bat collection, how we process them. You can get to see a bat up close. We did the same thing 
harp trapping at one of our uh, caves a couple, I guess that was last season that we got to do that. Um, any other questions on there? Okay. All right. I appreciate y'all listening to me and uh, come back tomorrow. I think Michaela will be talking about monarchs tomorrow.